Hey, people of planet Earth, I found a pair of spare brain cells. By rubbing them together, I've managed to find even more problems with Fallout 4. This time, I'm doubling it up. Instead of talking about four overarching problems, I'm going to go over eight smaller problems, rapid-fire style. So get ready. I didn't talk about the voiced protagonist issue in my previous two videos, because everyone and their mother knows by now how terrible Fallout 4's dialogue system is, and why having a voiced protagonist was a bad decision. Rather than rehash what a thousand people have said before, I want to come at it from another angle. A technical angle. The voiced protagonists required 26,000 lines of recorded dialogue that then had to be localized into four other languages. The cost in time and money to get this done must have been immense. It surely wasn't worth it, considering how many people despise this feature. Even people who don't hate it are at best ambivalent about the protagonist having a voice. All of the effort and cash wasted on this feature could have gone towards adding more dialogue for NPCs and populating the Commonwealth with many more interesting personalities instead. If those 26,000 lines had been used to add a dozen extra quests, Fallout 4 would have been a much better game. But no, Bethesda had to add voiced protagonists because... they wanted to make their game more cinematic, I guess? Well, it sure as shit doesn't feel cinematic. Only a handful of important scenes actually feature custom animations and camera angles. Most conversations reuse the same few generic animations and nothing interesting is going on with the camera work. In fact, the camera often bugs out and clips through walls or characters. Mass Effect 1 was way more cinematic than Fallout 4 despite releasing 8 years earlier. Having a voiced protagonist also shits on the modding community since they have no ability to add new player dialogue unless they can ring up Courtney Taylor and Brian Delaney. Failing that, the best they can do is splice pre-existing vanilla lines together, but the result is usually not good. This is yet another reason why Fallout 4 has fewer quest mods than Fallout 3 and New Vegas did. Any new content can never properly integrate with the base game due to this issue. Obviously this will never happen, but I think it would be a huge improvement if most characters weren't voiced at all, and their dialogue was presented as text boxes to read. I know, it's crazy, and people would call it a downgrade, but think about how much more dialogue there could be overall if most of it was left unvoiced. Think of how much easier it would be to iterate on quests, make them branch out, and add new choices. After all, it is far easier to type words into a text box and have them localized at the end of development than it is to hire expensive voice actors and cram them into a recording booth. The cost of voice actors is likely why, for example, so many of the Institute's experiments are only explained via terminal entries and why you can't talk with any Institute scientists about them. Bethesda likely discovered the Institute's plot holes after all dialogue was already finalized and had no choice but to try to paper them over using non-voiced exposition. An ideal solution would be to keep using voice actors for the main quest and important NPCs, but use an advanced text-to-speech solution for less important characters. I don't think it would sound that unnatural. Technology has come a long way since Microsoft Sam, after all. What did you just say about me, Punk? Uh, nothing, nothing. Nothing, Sam. I didn't say anything. Y you must be hearing things. Talk any more shit and I will kill you. Yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Sam. I'm so sorry. Bitch. Oh, God. Uh, this would also solve the problem of having too few unique voice actors to play the hundreds of characters featured in each game. If the speech can be synthesized on the fly, it would save many gigabytes of hard disk space, and allow Radiant Quests to be fully voiced. Interestingly, Todd Howard himself said in a Reddit AMA last year that such technology is used during development to create placeholder voices, but then he remarked that it's no substitute for real voice actors. It's possible that his stance could change over the next few years as text-to-speech technology improves further. But since Bethesda is always years behind the technological curve, I suspect another company will have to experiment with this idea first before they even dream about implementing it. I guess we'll have to wait and see what the future holds. If you go far enough down the Minutemen or Institute quest lines, you were automatically made leader of these two factions. Being named a leader would imply that you have the ability to make decisions and delegate tasks to your subordinates. 
Of course, this isn't the case. The general of the Minutemen, or dictator, I mean director, of the Institute, still gets treated like an errand boy to do infinite radiant quests until the heat death of the universe. I don't really understand why Preston nominates you to be general. He could have kept the title and perhaps been given some actual character development. If he stayed on as general, it would make a lot more sense since he's the one that orders you around for the duration of the main quest. However, the Minutemen are literally just five useless idiots cowering in a room when you first meet them, so naturally, being the only capable person around, it does fit that leadership falls on you. Being nominated as director of the Institute is an entirely different matter. Your son must be really stupid to trust you enough to hand over the keys to power. He just met you a short time ago and has every reason to distrust you, considering you almost certainly have had a negative opinion of the Institute planted in your head from your time topside. Other bureau directors with decades of experience are overlooked for the position because Shawnee Boy is feeling sentimental. Anyone who disagrees with Sean's decision to nominate you is shot down immediately. The director can do whatever he wants, there are no checks on his power. The Institute is a dictatorship, at least when Sean's running it. When you become director, there is no option to change the goals of the Institute or reform it in any way. There should be an option to immediately shut down synth production, deactivate all the synths, and transfer control of all facilities to the Brotherhood of Steel. Or an option to free the synths from slavery and hand the Institute over to the railroad. I understand that some scientists might rebel if you try to reform the Institute too quickly, and they do rebel against you in the quest A House Divided. But that has nothing to do with your policies, since you can't enact any, but rather because they think you're an outsider that can't be trusted. Still, there could have been a quest line dedicated to slowly transforming the Institute into something more amenable to the outside world, paring down the kidnapping and murdering, and reducing production of synths. Perhaps ceasefires with the Brotherhood and Railroad could be negotiated, using your standing with those factions as well as your charisma. Seriously, how is this not an option? Why can't you tell Elder Maxon or Desdemona to chill the fuck out and stop planning to destroy the Institute, since you're going to take it over and run shit differently? Okay, maybe they wouldn't listen, but the fact that you can't even attempt to make them see reason is crazy. It just shows that leadership means nothing in Fallout 4. The Minutemen are the most underdeveloped of the four main factions, which is a real shame since they should be the best hope the Commonwealth has. The Institute are a bunch of deranged psychopaths that view Wastelanders as guinea pigs for their pointless experiments. The Brotherhood are a bunch of callous a-holes. And the Railroad is just a dozen synth-obsessed hippies hiding in a church. How they're even a real faction is beyond me. The Minutemen, however, are a militia formed for the sole purpose of protecting innocent people from the Commonwealth's various threats at a moment's notice. They're the only faction that truly has the interests of the average person in mind. The Institute, Brotherhood, and Railroad are all completely alienated from regular people and their struggles. When settlers are being attacked, when someone's been kidnapped, when somebody's in need of food, water, or power, it's the Minutemen that go out of their way to help, not any of the other major factions. So it's too bad that they have basically no content. They don't have any worthwhile characters beyond the living meme Preston and this drug-addicted geriatric. The Minutemen questline is mostly nothing but Radiant Quests. That's right, Bethesda used Radiant Quests as mandatory filler content to pad out their otherwise painfully short questline. And the few quests that aren't Radiant crap still suck. Two of them are literally just settlement defense missions where you build a bunch of rocket turrets and hide in a corner while synths or Brotherhood Knights get torn to shreds. It's boring as hell. And their ending is broken. Let me explain. The first time I beat Fallout 4, I went down the Minuteman route and didn't bother doing any quests for the Brotherhood or Railroad. In fact, I didn't even spawn the Pridwin Inn. The main quest is so poorly designed that a major event, the Brotherhood arriving in force, doesn't trigger unless you exit Fort Hagen the specific way Bethesda intended. I didn't realize that at the time, I just left the way I came in, I thought that was okay. Shame on me, I guess. The funny thing is, it didn't even end up mattering, because the Brotherhood literally aren't involved in the Minutemen quest line at all. After destroying the Institute, I went over to Cambridge Police Station. The squad there acted as if I had completed most of their quests including Blind Betrayal, where it's revealed that Paladin Dance is a synth. I did no such thing. 
I went to the Old North Church where the railroad was mourning the loss of Glory, who was supposed to die during the railroad quest line. The only problem was, she was still alive, because I didn't do those quests. Did Bethesda even test all possible endings before releasing this game? Next time you play Fallout 4, try beating the game with the Minutemen without doing any Brotherhood or Railroad content. You will be amazed by how broken the ending is. It's like Bethesda didn't even care. The Minutemen are nothing more than a fallback faction they put no effort into beyond the starting quest in Concord. Maybe they're called the Minutemen because that's how much time was spent developing them. One minute. Bethesda's designers seem to think that good world building is placing skeletons in compromising positions all over the place. They have no clue how to craft a believable world. Obviously for the sake of playability, things like scale need to be fudged. Diamond City is far from a city by any stretch of the imagination. Its population numbers less than 60 people all told, lower than all but the tiniest of real world hamlets. The entire map has been similarly compressed into an area nearly 10 times smaller than the real-life city of Boston. This is acceptable because without an automobile, it would take hours to travel across a realistically sized map, and most of it would be empty, wasted space. What's less understandable is this. Abandoned buildings overrun by mutated creatures still have working lights, turrets, terminals, and elevators after 210 years. That's ridiculous. The old power grid should have been immediately destroyed by nuclear detonations, let alone two centuries without additional fuel or maintenance. There shouldn't be any electricity in most locations. I would be more willing to forgive this oversight if it was consistent, if technology worked without power everywhere. But some areas very clearly do have post-war power networks, like Diamond City. The guards even have a dialogue line where they remark how amazing it is that the Great Green Jewel has working lights but nearly every location in the game has electric lighting. It's not impressive in the slightest. Settlements built by the player also need power. You're required to build generators and wire them up to many of the same objects you see working without power elsewhere. It's totally inconsistent. YouTubers have released half-hour-long videos on this subject, attempting to reconcile the discrepancies, throwing out dozens of theories about underground power plants or room temperature super... room temperature super... Fuck, that's hard to say. Room temperature superconductors, most of them unsupported by the game's lore. The real answer is much simpler. The level designers didn't give a damn. They never gave a moment's thought to this issue. They were told that interiors needed to be well lit, and so they placed lights wherever they wanted, with no regard for how those lights would be powered. There was nobody in charge to make sure that only human settled areas had electric power and that it was always given an actual source. If interiors really needed to be lit up, there were other ways to accomplish the task. Radioactive moss or fungi could have been placed in overgrown areas. Roofs or walls could be caved in to allow sunlight to pass through. There could be generators you insert fusion cores into to temporarily restore a building's power. Or here's an idea. Just let some areas be dark. We have a Pip-Boy light, why not give us a reason to use it? If the devs clearly didn't care, why should we? Why is it such a big deal anyways that a couple of lights are still on when they shouldn't be? Well, think. The main reason the nuclear apocalypse happened was due to global resource shortages that forced major imperial powers to invade their neighbors. If Boston's power grid is capable of running on fumes for over two centuries, that means there never was any resource crisis to begin with. It makes the entire backstory of the series nonsensical. It's important to note that good world building naturally leads to good quest design. Thinking back to the Minutemen, it would have been incredible if some of their shitty Radiant quests had been replaced with missions to clear out pre-war power plants and get them operational again. Maybe some of those plants could be occupied by the Institute, who are siphoning the power to their underground installation. After taking over a plant, nearby ruins and settlements would receive energy from it, making the former easier to explore because the lights are now on, and the latter would join the Minutemen. This would have given the Minutemen a concrete goal that would help them unite the Commonwealth, and put them in direct conflict with the Institute. This is important since these two factions are lacking any real motivation to attack each other. It would also help explain how the Institute has enough power to build a synth army and run a high-tech facility despite their fusion reactor being offline. Fallout 4's Brotherhood of Steel has adopted a genocidal attitude towards super mutants and synths. 
In the mission Loose Ends, they task you with killing Virgil, not because he's a former member of the Institute, but simply because he's a super mutant. If you cure Virgil, they agree to put him under observation rather than outright assassinate him. It's abundantly clear from the Brotherhood's rhetoric that they view synths and super mutants as abominations created by a gross misuse of old world technology. And yet, they allow the player to bring Strong, a super mutant, or Nick Valentine, a synth prototype, on board the Pridwin. Brotherhood soldiers have angry dialogue when they see Nick or Strong, which means that Bethesda was at least aware of this massive contradiction. Sadly, they didn't take it all the way and have the Knights kill Nick or Strong on sight. This might be a huge blow to the player, but it's not like they're the only two companions in the game. Strong is not essential to the main quest, and by the time the Brotherhood show up on the Pridwin, Nick Valentine's plot critical role is already almost over. Yeah, it would be a shame to lose access to his side quests and all the unique interactions with him, especially in Far Harbor. But that should be the price you have to pay for supporting a faction that wants all synths eradicated without exception. If Elder Maxon is barely willing to allow Paladin Dance, a trusted friend he's known for years, to live, once his synth identity is revealed, there's no way in hell he'd let some synth private dick he's never seen before so much as exist within his presence. Contrast this with how Boone is handled in Fallout New Vegas. If you go near any Legion soldiers with him as a companion, he will fucking light them up on sight. If you have a bad reputation with the NCR, he will leave you or attack you. This makes sense. Being able to join Caesar's Legion with Boone at your side would be crazy, since he absolutely despises them for kidnapping and enslaving his wife and unborn child. What's odd is when you travel with Dance after completing Blind Betrayal, the Brotherhood turns hostile until you remove him as your companion. The same could have been done for both Nick and Strong, but Bethesda decided there can't be any meaningful consequences for our actions in-game. In Fallout 3 and New Vegas, weapons and armor would become damaged over time and need repair. This mechanic was removed entirely from Fallout 4. It's a real head-scratcher why this was done, since both mechanically and thematically, it's a much better fit for Fallout 4 than it ever was for Fallout 3 or New Vegas. In previous games, the only way to repair equipment yourself was by finding an identical or similar piece of gear and combining the two together. In this game, equipment maintenance could have utilized crafting materials instead. This would have given many components an alternative use for players that don't want to mess around with the settlement system. Many of Fallout 4's weapons are rusty and makeshift designs. They don't look very reliable, making the fact they never malfunction or break strange. A lot of armor sets are cobbled together from junk, and look like they could fall apart any second, but they never do. Only power armor pieces have condition. That means the most expensive armor ever developed by any military in human history can be damaged by prolonged gunfire, but that crappy armor you looted off a raider will last forever. A cool detail is the minigun's barrel turning red hot if you fire it long enough, but sadly this is only a visual effect. It would be interesting if automatic weapons could overheat, causing them to jam more often and degrade faster. This would be a far better way to balance automatic weaponry than making them do less damage than their semi-auto counterparts. It's hard to come up with explanations for why equipment condition isn't present in Fallout 4, but one reason might be that Bethesda's animators were too lazy to make animations for weapon jamming. It's also possible that there wasn't enough room on the perk tree for repair-focused perks. Or maybe it's because Skyrim also removed durability, which was present in Oblivion, and nobody complained about it, so Bethesda took that design decision forward into Fallout 4 without really thinking about it too much. Whatever the reason, Bethesda clearly learned from this mistake and re-implemented durability into Fallout 76, although they may have only done it to fleece the player base with predatory microtransactions. Fallout 4 continues a trend Fallout 3 started, where super mutants act like a hive mind, they're angry all the time, and they like to eat people. They also like to kidnap people, even though it doesn't make any sense. Commonwealth super mutants were created inside the Institute. Only the Institute has access to FEV. That means there's no way for super mutants to reproduce by creating more of themselves. So why are they kidnapping settlers in Radiant Quests? The game tries to explain it by saying that they're being held for a ransom payment, but super mutants don't have any use for currency since they don't trade with humans. 
and who in their right mind would attempt to barter with creatures that are nothing but violent orcs? Super mutants really didn't need to be in Fallout 4 at all. Bethesda could have easily invented a replacement creature that fit their need for a big, bullet sponge enemy type, and done it without resorting to absurd post hoc justifications for their existence. They might as well not exist because nothing interesting has been done with them in this game. They're purely generic enemies to shoot. Of course, an FPS game needs opponents to kill, but they could have and should have been given more characterization than... I'M ANGRY! If there were, for instance, different clans of super mutants, each one having a leader with a somewhat unique personality, that would be something. It wouldn't be great, but it would at least be a starting point to build some real lore. Bethesda didn't even reach the starting line with super mutants. It's sad. When people use the phrase, that's not realistic, what they often really mean is, that's not internally consistent. Let's completely shelve the term realism, because the Fallout series has never been realistic. The wacky physics and chemistry of this world are pulled straight out of 1950s science fiction. In real life, radiation will kill you within a few days or weeks, and smaller doses can give you cancer later on. Recovery from radiation poisoning is a slow and excruciatingly painful process. But in the Fallout universe, you can take as many rads as you like as long as you don't go over 1,000. And you can inject an IV bag and be radiation-free in a short time. Everyone is willing to accept this because the world has an internal logic whose rules are clear, consistent, and understandable. This pre-established lore shouldn't be broken at a whim. I understand that some retcons are inevitable, and if they benefit the game overall, it's probably worth doing them. For example, adding new types of power armor and turning it into more of a vehicle rather than a suit you put on was one of Fallout 4's great new additions, even if it did contradict pre-existing lore about power armor. But many of its retcons add no value whatsoever. Two examples. One, it was established in every other Fallout game that ghouls need to eat and drink, just like regular humans although they probably don't need to eat and drink as often as regular people do. Fallout 4 broke this rule because somebody thought the kid in a fridge was a good quest idea. I hope they were fired. 2. It was established in Fallout 2 that Jet is made from Brahmin feces, and was invented well after the Great War. Fallout 4 turns it into a pre-war drug because the writers were too lazy to do a cursory amount of research. After release, they could have easily patched out references to Jet in pre-war terminal entries and removed it from the leveled lists of untouched ruins, but they didn't. Either because they didn't care, or again, because they were too lazy. Changing ghoul physiology or the origins of Jet might not sound like a big deal, but it demonstrates that Bethesda has made a habit out of messing with the canon, not for good reason, but due to a worrying lack of concern for the product they're putting out. And that concludes my third video on the topic of stuff Fallout 4 does badly. At this point, I think I've run out of things to talk about. I might make another video covering the DLCs eventually, but I'll have to complete another full playthrough of Far Harbor and Nuka World first. Besides that, I'll be releasing more videos on this channel every Tuesday, and I won't stop until I'm either dead or in prison, or YouTube doesn't exist anymore. So expect at least five more months of content out of me. Toodles!